Okay, the podcast set up downtown. We got motion. What's the idea? People, the conversation's open. The Andrews group, the firm. Yeah, we here now. Let's talk about great ideas. Have a sit down. Welcome to the podcast. The idea people. And welcome to the idea people at Lee Andrews Group. I'm your host, Rick Garcia. In celebration of Women's History Month, we have invited some amazing women to join us on this podcast uh, this month. And today we welcome Dr. Erica Etlin. She's an expert on healthy buildings. And we're going to explain what that means. I also have to explain, because she's more commonly known as a health scientist, <laughs> and the youngest scientist I think I've ever met in my oh, life. Wow. Uh, well, welcome to the program. We appreciate it. Thank you. Um, and let me just talk a little bit about uh, your background before we get into uh, the Q&A here. Uh, Dr. Edlin is a director of human Exper- the Human Experience Lab at Perkins & Will. That's an architecture firm in Boston. And uh, Perkin- Perkins & Will's first public health scientist on the staff, correct? Uh, so we'll blow it up a little bit more, yeah. you know, and uh, let's... I'm not an egotistical person, but let's get them right. Uh, so Perkins & Will is the second largest architecture firm in the world. Mm. Uh, and I'm the first public health scientist in a leadership role anywhere in the architectural industry. So it's uh, some big shoes to fill and sort of make some real impact. So yeah. we're, we're mixing things up. So, so let's brag about your background. You, you received your doctorate from uh, the Harvard Chan School of Public Health and Environmental Health. Yep. Masters of Public Health and Climate and Health from Columbia. Yep. And did you really graduate at the age of 16? Uh, from high school, yeah. From high school? Yeah. How did that happen? You have one good Indian mother, that's all you need. <laughs> and then and then the rest is set, so. Well, welcome again to the idea of people at Lee Andrews Group. You ready to, to get into this uh, I'm program? Ready. Oh. What is a human experience lab? When I first read this, I thought science fiction. I mean, that's the exciting part, right? Is science fiction is when you can sort of make fiction, nonfiction. So uh, for me, human experience lab is basically a research arm of this architecture firm that is bringing public health research and methods into the design process. So if we think about buildings, we spend 90% of our time indoors. And yet, when we talk about sort of buildings at this juncture, we're talking about sustainability, energy efficiency. But if we're not talking about people, then we're just making energy efficient sculptures. They're not actually sort of in pursuit of our well-being, the places we live, learn, play. And so Human Experience Lab is really dedicated to making sure that no matter what user or occupant is in that space, that they're welcome, that their health is being promoted, not just mitigating risks from COVID and indoor air quality, but really sort of holistically thinking about how do we serve the people that occupy our built environment. And when I think about a lab, I'm thinking beakers and and uh, test tubes and or or even some crash test dummies. I know. What I, what does your lab look like? <laughs> so our lab is uh, more of a ecosystem of nerds. I'll be real honest. <laughs> okay, we, we An ecosystem that. of nerds, uh, because I think our laboratory is the built environment. So we are working on projects, everything from schools for students with severe disabilities, cognitive, visual, auditory. How do we design a space better for them? But then also a firehouse, and how do you make sure our firefighters are sleeping? properly, not being exposed to cancer-causing substances from soot, and, you know, making sure that they have camaraderie and joy in those spaces. So I would say our lab is not filled with beakers, but on a good day, a lot of, like, air quality sensors, um, you know, a lot of data sort of coming in and being informed by the people themselves. So it's kind of this important use of surveys and focus groups and letting people be the experts of their own own human experience and not trying to go in and say, we know better for you. So it's a bit of mix. So what are the key ingredients to a healthy building? So you can define it in a lot of ways. I think for us, and while I was at Harvard, I was a part of the Healthy Buildings program, and we defined healthy building as the nine foundations of a healthy building, and that was indoor air quality, thermal comfort, so what temperature, the humidity, you know, daylight, acoustics, background noise. Um, and so all of those different features have impacts on our, our human physiology, whether it's our ability to just not... Uh, you know, have headaches and scratchy, you know, throats in a space, or is it our attention comprehension? You know, we've all sat in a, a conference room where it's gotten real stuffy, and you're just like, I need to get out of here. Well, that's because the CO2 level, the carbon dioxide that we're all exhaling, has neurotoxic effects. And as we sit in that space, we're going to naturally get sleepy because our brain is looking for oxygen. But from a building's perspective, where does our ventilation kick in? How does it make sure that we're taking all that CO2 out so we can really enjoy that space? So these are kind of these intimate relationships that our buildings are having on our body. 
Well, when it comes to architecture, we think uh, uh, and, and design, we think uh, visual. Uh, right? Of course. And um, yeah. so the question is, how do you incorporate public health considerations into that design? So again, this goes back to like, what's the definition of a healthy building? So you can have these environmental health factors, air quality, temperature. I think when it comes to embedding some of this other work, though, it is about joy and culture and being able to ensure that we're having sort of spaces that help in thriving. And so addressing mental health challenges. And so that might look like just needing spaces to restore, having access to nature, which we know has incredible benefits on, you know, reducing fatigue and memory improvements. And so those are opportunities where holistically thinking about it, we have this chance to promote both the physical and mental health of, of occupants. Dr. Erica uh, at uh, Etlin is uh, our, our guest on uh, uh, on the Idea People at uh, Lee Andrews Group. She's a health scientist. I stumbled over your last name because you and I talked about your last name, yeah. the derivations of it and the way it's spelled. I want to say Eitland, yep. and I'm trying to continue to say Etlin. And you said, really, it is Eitlin, but that you've been calling yourself Etlin for yeah. you know, no, since so... the beginning of time. What, what, where do you, you mentioned your Indian mother. Yep. Where yeah. does your family hail from? Uh, so my dad's, uh, you know, a good Midwesterner. He's from Minnesota. He got Norwegian, Swedish roots. So that's how I ran, you know, wound up with the name Erica Etland. Uh, but because my mom's Bengali, we soften our E's. So it's, you know, when I go to Europe later this year, I'll, I think I'll be Etland the entire time. But amongst friends, it's Etland. Okay, fair enough. Now, when it comes to Arctic uh, architecture, I mentioned we were talking about design. Uh, how about those healthy ingredients we talked about and, and how it might relate to affordable housing projects. I mean, you know, money seems to be important, right? When we're sure. trying to figure out what to, to build. Yeah. I mean, I think when it comes to healthy design, affordable housing or otherwise, I think you have to make health really a part of you have to integrate it really early. So one of the metaphors I like is, you know, if we think of public health as the butter, you know, Nobody's ever said that, but stick with me, is that, you know, you can have a piece of toast and you can apply that butter to it. And, you know, you have a baked idea and then comes the health applied to it. And that allows us to say we have healthy spaces. But what I'm really hoping for when we talk about things like affordable housing is we have sort of a three layered funfetti cake with buttercream frosting. And that butter is so integrated into every element of what that is. So when it comes to affordable housing, we start the process of design with understanding we need to be supporting, you know, people's ability to pay the bills when it comes to energy. We need to make sure that they have access to daylight and views, that acoustically we're making sure that they are able to sleep fully and soundly in those spaces. And so when we were doing research during the pandemic, working with you know affordable housing uh, buildings across the US, what we found was even just like talking to our seniors who were in Chicago and Englewood, and they what they wanted to talk about, what a healthy building was for them, is a place they could get frisky. That all they wanted to do was connect I'm sorry, with each other. Could you explain? <laughs> they just really wanted some together time. Really? They really okay. were like, yeah, okay, this whole social distancing, yeah, that's a physical distancing, but we don't want social distancing. And I think that was the interesting thing is that we were so focused on everybody sort of being separate from each other that how can our buildings, you know, be controlled in a way and designed in a way that allows us to actually keep the thing that makes us human. And so, you know, even just thinking about a, an affordable housing unit, there was this moment where it's like, okay, well, we've taken care of the air quality issue. You weren't going to get any disease. But then we asked people, well, what do you care about? And they were like, it's really hot or it's really cold. I can't control this. And I'm now stuck in this unit for, you know, 100% of the day. And then they were talking about noise. And in the seniors, you know, not only did they want to get frisky and be together and flirt with each other, but it was also this idea of they wanted to be able to garden around their building. And because of crime, they were kind of going through this double, you know, health crisis, which was safety as well as the pandemic simultaneously. And so people are stealing their flowers out of their front yard. And they're like, what the hell? Why? You know, so I think it is thinking about it from a holistic lens and making sure that we ask those people, what do you really care about? Because if you asked a lot of other scientists, they say indoor air quality, better ventilation, you're good to go. And yet by having these really honest conversations, we realize that, you know, it's actually so much more than that. Uh, can we re-envision the design of ballrooms and conference rooms? You, you walk into these spaces and they're basically four walls. Oh, it's they the get worst. decorated from the inside, right? A bunch of tables and tablecloths and flowers and stuff. And now we've got a now we've got a ball ready to yeah to host. 
Yeah, no, I mean, I think when I think of like conference spaces specifically, it's one of the saddest situations. You're, I mean, I think one thing we got to establish first is that our buildings have an impact on our health. So, you know, if we even think about our kids, kids are some of the most sensitive populations. And so, you know, they breathe 50% more air than we do. Their eyes are more sensitive to daylight. And so therefore it affects their sleep when they're in a windowless space. And so all of these features are driving our experience within that space. Are we able to focus? Are we able to perform well on a test? Are we able to be productive at work? And so, you know, you have like the conference room example and it's, we're putting people in places where there's no access to daylight, which is the thing that we need to be alert and have lighting that allows us to sort of stimulate our brain in that way. Typically, the ventilation, not great. So you have this sort of cognitive challenge simultaneously. And then you're kind of packing people in there. Acoustics not, might not be great. If you're in the back of the room, you're not hearing it. So the whole goal of a conference room and or conference space is getting kind of diluted if the building hasn't been designed for the people who are trying to receive that information. So, is it the same? So, would it still be the same for schools or or different idea? Ooh, I love schools. Schools is my favorite. Schools is, I think, actually one of the most important types of buildings in our country, and it is one of the most underinvested spaces across the country. So, when we talk about schools, about you know, most of our buildings, our school buildings, were built after the baby boom during World War II. And so what's interesting about that is you have 65% of our buildings being 50 years old at this point. And yet for decades, we've had national reports coming out saying that those buildings are falling down. And because they're built in the 50s, 60s, it's also predating all of our environmental exposure you know, legislation that we did, EPA, and being able to remove so many of those chemicals from our built environment. So asbestos, I heard you're a fan of asbestos. <laughs> I mean, that's relative. But, you know, asbestos, lead, all of those things are persisting in our buildings. And because we haven't made that investment, our kids are exposed to it. They're, you know, sitting on the floor. It's on their hands. They're eating it. And so those things have impacts where we know it's going into their brain like lead. And so we need to be able to take care of them. But when I think about schools, it's also a big topic about their workplaces. They're not just for our kiddos. And so, you know, 77% of teachers are women. And yet, when we think about the acoustics of a classroom, you know, I was in Indianapolis earlier this week, and it was just interesting because we were talking with some of these schools, and it's 80 degrees, you know, in the middle of, of March, and they've turned fans on, they don't have air conditioning. So the teacher is now having to sort of scream over this noise. And they can't focus because it's too hot for them. And yet women have smaller larynxes. So their you know, ability, their throats actually vibrate more quickly. So when we have to sort of scream louder, we sort of celebrate teacher's voice as being this you know, iconic thing. But really what it's doing is putting incredible strain on our teachers and especially our women. And so you know, rates that are so much higher than just the normal population, um, and yet we're we're not doing anything about it. Dr. Erica Etlin is a health scientist. She's on the Idea People at Lee Andrews Group. Uh, did I read also where smell can sometimes factor into some of this? Um, I don't know if that involves green spaces or uh, it maybe goes back to the ventilation. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that this could go. So smell could be an odor issue uh, where it's saying we're under ventilating space. So kind of to the point of schools, nothing like a whole bunch of smelly teenagers and realizing your ventilation's good, broken. Good um, but you know, what's really cool is that for folks that maybe can't see where it is, you know, we, you mentioned architecture and design is very aesthetically driven. I think one thing that we've had to really kind of challenge within human experiences, what are all of the senses? If you cannot see, you know, and if we think about occupants that are visually impaired or blind, then how can smell be a part of this, of knowing where they are in a space? And so, you know, we're working on this school in Boston and we've basically designed the building so it's kind of, there's asymmetry in the smell. So one side is the cafeteria, so the kids are gonna smell that, it's a, a predominantly visually impaired population. And on the other side is their therapy pool, their swimming pool. And so you have this very like chlorine oriented smell on one side and food smell on the other. And for them, that's a part of being able to understand where they are in that space so that they're not overwhelmed or scared, not knowing where they're going. How do we shift mindsets to prioritize budgets? I mean, 
in the fight for climate change, folks learned that if, if they started talking about the economy and how it's sure. good for business, those people that, that are tone deaf to, to some of those issues like that, oh, oh, money, you know, I, I perk up a little bit. And in this case, how can we get folks uh, at, at all levels, local and, and federal, to, to want to invest in this? I think it's one of the, the harder parts of the equation. So for anybody listening, you know, we need your help being able to do that quantification. I would say that to me, there's the issue is first cost versus the total cost of a space. So the first cost is, you know, how much it takes to build a building. But the total cost is, you know, are you even from like a workplace perspective, are you able to retain your staff? Are you able to even bring your staff back to the office? Are you able to have really productive, you know, staff when they're in that space? Those things have economic sort of benefits to them if you are designing spaces with them in mind. And so to me, there's sort of definitely different metrics that could be used, but don't maybe have the dollar sign applied to them. If I think about it, you know, from a, a school's perspective, again, it's this idea that, you know, for any teacher who's absent, you also have to bring in a substitute teacher. And so how much is that cost of the additional substitutes because the teachers are, are out because of vocal strain or asthma or some other sort of health condition brought on by that building. So I think there's ways for us to estimate it, uh, but it's it's kind of the squishy stuff. If a public health person's done their job right, then you don't have anything happen. There is no pandemic. There is no you know obesity challenge or anything. So it's a little bit harder. Okay, so in the short time I've known you, I know you're not shy. Oh, yeah. Right? Is that fair to? Yeah. You've presented your research in front of some important audiences, the World Bank, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency among them. How, how how's your work being received? I think, you know, it's a, a funny thing to be a public healther at a design firm, right? I think within the public health community, we know these things are important. We know our environment matters. I think we know it, especially in the context of climate change. Um, and so there's sort of, you kind of evangelize the willing to say, okay, we need inv- environmental justice, but we also need indoor environmental justice. And what does that look like? So I think those people are out there and there's some incredible organizations pushing that forward. I think when it comes to decision makers or designers, the true understanding that our design decisions, when we remove windows from classrooms, has implications on the people who occupy that space, I don't think that's as clear as we think it is. And I think we have to do a better job of turning architects into advocates to be able to help explain this relationship. Because I'm sure before you walked in here, how often had you thought about what's the air quality? Is it, you know, what's the wayfinding? How did I get to this space? We just assume it as like, oh, that's sort of the complication of living a daily life. But those are design decisions. You know, if there's glare on your computer, that's a design decision. Where is the window placed? Where's your desk placed? And so those are opportunities for us to, I don't know, kind of widen the conversation, make it more personal, because I don't think public health alone can solve it. We need people who can take action, who can invest in it, who can sort of help us do that economic analysis so that we're all kind of winning it together. What are some of the challenges convincing leaders? I mean, do folks look at you and say, ah, this is, this is BS? I don't think there's a, a BS component to it. I, I have a little more optimism on that one. I think the hard part is, is after a pandemic, we're just tired. We have a lot of things we have to fight against. You know, we're tired because we just sort of lost so much. There was a sort of this loss of joy, loss of celebration. And now we're sort of in just recovery mode. And you're like, you want me to care about air quality again? I just did it. We didn't get COVID. We're moving on. And so what I worry about is from public health sort of challenges is that we kind of have, I'd like to say it's a sort of a whack-a-mole situation where, you know, we had Flint and the water crisis and thinking about lead. That led to a lot of change and then that fizzled out. Then we had, you know, a focus on asbestos and recognizing, you know, as our buildings deteriorate, we're at greater exposure. Okay, let's focus on that. Now we're going to talk about air quality for a hot second and let's move on to extreme heat because, oh, by the way, we have these sort of intense hot days when we shouldn't. And what is that doing to our older populations? You know, we have to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, we did it with paint and lead too, right? Exactly. And the kids were eating the paint chips off the wall. and then later, Right? It's crazy. You smell good and you're, okay. Yeah. Um, 
so did you originally set out to be a health scientist? I don't, I've never met a health scientist. We, we've already mentioned that. Uh, a lot of people we know are, are pursuing uh, environmental related careers, environmental sure. justice, climate awareness. When did this, this thought pop into your head? It's a good question. I, so it's funny. I mean, I've spent a lot of time, you know, in my childhood kind of going back and forth to Calcutta in India, where my mom's from. And it was one of these things where by kind of being in that city, you realize all of this discussion about Venice. Oh, it's a sinking city. It's a sinking city. But the way that Calcutta is shaped, it's actually on a hill. And what has happened is, is that that community in that city, because of sort of these colonial ties, has you know, some older infrastructure, it's about 100 years, you know, old now at this point. And yet, all of, as they sort of expand, and as cities grow and sprawl, all of the people who are the, you know, serving tea and taxi drivers and all of that, they are the lowest part of this hill that floods, that puts them at risk. And so then there's these societal challenges of who knows how to swim, who doesn't, there's gender disparities that are there. And as I started to understand how does our city and our design and where we place people and their, that lived experience, our history is, you know, the past is the prologue is sort of the line. But I think for me, it was recognizing, oh, this has a direct impact. There's an implication here. And so I kind of set out to respond to climate, I think, first as a way to maybe sort of be supportive of that city and recognize the others that don't have, say, the ability, the sort of social capital and sort of financial capital to be able to invest in the way we want to. Let me take me back inside the uh, human experience lab, if you would. You've created some tools, I guess, that, mm -hmm. that people can access and, and get more information about uh, the work you're doing and maybe ways that they can help them think a little differently about uh, our approach to, to buildings. Yeah. So... I think the I'll start with kind of the, the latest and greatest, in my opinion, it needs help, but we're getting there, is the public uh, repository to engage community and enhance design equity. So it's called Proceed. And so if you go to proceed.perkinswell.com, you can find it. But basically, the tool is designed to bring in public health data from EPA, CDC, census to be able for anywhere in the U.S. for us to determine what are the health priorities in in that project site. From the moment we know the address, what is driving it? And when we recognize that, you know, back in the 1930s, we redlined communities. And still today, if you live in redlined community, your life expectancy is four years less than your non-redlined counterparts. So Proceed was really developed to be able to say, not everyone can have a fully healthy building. We can't all have the best air quality because it costs money. It, we all can't have best thermal comfort and daylight and kind of all the maybe bougie amenities we want. But if design is to be intentional, then how can we pinpoint? Should we be focused on asthma? Should we be focused on obesity? Should we be focused on aging in place? Because we know that budgets dictate what sticks and what stays. And so what we found is, is that tool is publicly available. It's there to educate designers on why public health is important. It's there to sort of quantify exactly what are these different health metrics that you should care about and open that dialogue. And then it is paired with strategies so that, you know, if you realize that extreme heat's an important issue, you can do something about it. And so we're actively kind of building out version two right now. But I think it being transparent the goal is, is not for Perkins and Will to be like, we love people the most. Time is of the essence. We don't have time to waste on this. And so the goal is, is that all design firms are starting to embed health in their thinking. I think one of the things, most shocking things that came out of the pandemic, and you as a health scientist, and you've talked about data and mm -hmm. science, is all of a sudden this chunk of society that are second guessing science and scientists. Mm -hmm. Does that make you nuts? Makes me nuts, and I'm not a scientist. It, it makes me nuts, and yet at the same time, I think I kind of turn it back to my people, my scientists out there, is that we have to be able to communicate. We need to be able to share effectively. We need to be able to kind of sit down at a kitchen table and let me break down why is carbon dioxide so important to us. Those things allow us to have sort of shared conversation about it. But if you don't understand it or you get defensive of, like, you're talking down to me, we're out. And I think in working with, you know, other scientists, we also have to be super precise on answering a research question. We need to know 
deeply what's happening. But when we come to decision making, it's very hard to only listen to one part of that. You need all of the pieces simultaneously. And I think that's actually been the biggest gift of, you know, being a part of the Human Experience Lab is we have to be thinking about policy. We have to be thinking about what developers want when they're building a building. We need to think about architects who have to now learn and understand why do you want me to care about greenness and mental health in my design? We just want it to be energy efficient. And yet that there's all of these players here. And so I think it's, it's, a, it's a collective challenge. I don't think it's any one person. And I wouldn't say, oh, it's their fault for not receiving science. It's also the fact that we haven't been great at making it sexy and fun for people. And there's a joy to it. And it's a part of the answer. And so we got to work on that. You kind of have to make it cool. And we think you're cool. And we're glad Thanks. that you're on the idea of people at Lee Andrews Group. But you, as a guest, but yeah. you're also a host of your own podcast. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I get to be the co-host of the Inhabit podcast. So it's a podcast focused on the power of design. Uh, and I think in some ways it's sort of a, a public health love letter. I think to me, design is a public health intervention. And so in our first season, we really were talking about these indoor environments. So air quality, even the materials in a sofa, how they you know become a part of our bodies. And so you are what you eat, but you are also what your couch is. So that's real. Uh, you know, and then talking about, we went to San Diego, there's an incredible brewery out there called Border X Brewing. And it's about sort of embracing our multiculturalism and being able to say, who is designing our buildings? And so it's a, it's interesting because we have a, a population that's been predominantly white male leadership, but that means it leaves out so many people who occupy our spaces, our, our women, our people of color, our, our disabled, uh, you know, friends and colleagues. And so I think that's something where it's it's beneficial to bring different people to that table. And so Border X is a, a James Beard um, finalist, and they make this incredible pepino sour so it's a cucumber beer and i kid you not i like took a sip and started to cry because it brought me back to india and like oh having gosh. this cucumber salad mm -hmm. and you just are like the ability for this collision of experience and design you know they're they're peeling a thousand cucumbers and make this beer and yet it was worth it because there's an excellence to it and the last you know season right now that we're working on is we went to toronto again thinking about just sort of immigration and multiculturalism and how does it play out in our public space and so I took a photo and I sent it to my co-host at literally moments as I walked in here because you know in our, our first episode we were talking about the importance of signage and this importance of you know do not let your dog pee on my you know flowers you know do not sit here do not park here and there's all these don'ts but the sign outside your building actually has this beautiful list of all the do's, do chat, do hang out. I would say like do make out and yet like don't, you know, smoke, don't do some of these other things. And I think that was actually the first time I've ever seen a sign like that that is encouraging us of what can this space be for you and inviting people in, not just telling them, you know, to be constrained. So, you know, that podcast has been a really exciting experience for me because it's with interior designers, urban designers. We, you know, went and sort of ate all this great food in Toronto. And I think there's so many other metaphors in life that are design decisions, food being a big one of them. And so we're hoping that that helps kind of bring everyone into this this conversation with us. So to wrap this up neatly, if for those listeners uh, like me, who's I'm not an architect, I'm not a scientist, and I'm and for listeners who are thinking, I can't, I can't make a difference. What can I do? What's your uh, advice to them? Oof. I think every day we make design decisions, we make health decisions. I think if you're a parent, you know, your school's facility manager does more for your kid's health on a day-to-day -day basis than your pediatrician does. So I we have a resource called Healthy K-12 by design, um, healthyk12.perkinswell.com. And that's all of the strategies. It's the science. It's the research. Why should you care? What can we do? And I think that's, you know, one population. I think if you're kind of looking and reflecting on your, on yourself and your own homes, you know, when I was back at Harvard um, for health, Dot org was all these resources from everything from airplanes to your home that, you know, by being able to explore that, you also have the evidence for action. So I think it's just we can do little things. It doesn't you know, it can be just taking your shoes off before you walk in the house because you're tracking in all these chemicals and pollutants that were on your feet. And if you got kids, pets, whatever, 
your pets and your kids are, you know, in that. And do we want that to be a part of our bloodstream and lead to other sort of health consequences? That makes sense. And listen, we're cool with plugs. If you want to say those websites again slower. Yeah. Oh, of course. Please. We'd, we'd love to, <laughs> so folks can write them down. Go ahead. Yeah. So the first is Healthy K-12 by design. And if you just go to healthyk12.perkinswill.com, you can access our latest research as well as some of our policy initiatives in Massachusetts and in Indiana, really trying to help our policymakers make a difference. Uh, if you want to check out the Inhabit podcast, again, easy, uh, inhabit.perkinswill.com. And because it's a research-based podcast, our show notes, I mean, could be a whole study guide in themselves. So nerd out with us. We uh, really feel strongly about that. Um, and I think other things, you know, if you're interested in Proceed and that sort of public health dashboard and just want to look it up for your own community and what does it look like, uh, that's just proceed, again, .perkinswill.com. So, I mean, our team really works hard to make things transparent. So if people want to reach out, we're happy to share, you know, the nerd work we're doing. Dr. Erica uh, Etlin, we, we so appreciate the work you're doing. You're the one in the trenches, rolling up your sleeves, making a difference, and the rest of us are taking advantage of it. We do appreciate that. And thank you so much for being a guest on the Idea People at Lee Andrews Group. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. And for more information about us, check out leeandrewsgroup.com. Okay, the podcast set up downtown. We got most of the idea people, the conversations open. Lee Andrews Group, the firm. Yeah, we here now. Let's talk about great ideas. Have a sit We down. on a mission. Hey, you get the idea, people. Glad you pulled up. How you doing? Nice to meet Let's you. Go in.